Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, and the officers and members of this church. We're just so blessed that you are joining us for our general Sunday School lesson overview. Today's lesson is entitled, God is Trustworthy, and it's focused on the sixth chapter of Hebrews, verses 9 through 20. Our key verses are Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, and taken from the New King James Version, they read, This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having becoming high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So in today's lesson, it's our goal that first we will examine God's promise to Abraham and see how he is faithful to all of his promises to all of his children. We will examine how we can keep promises of our own in our own lives. And then third and finally, we will identify the promises of God that support and motivate both our faith and our actions. And so I'm really excited about today's lesson. Uh, it really helps and encourages us that when we experience shortcomings, setbacks, and uh, discomfort in ministry, that we can remain steadfast knowing that as we look back over our lives through the history of God's word and through the testimonies of our ancestors, that we can see that God has never been short of his word, that he's always kept his promises, and that the word of God will come through to, will come to fruition in the lives of his children. We'll begin with prayer, and we'll jump right into our lesson. As always, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel, turn on notifications. Not only will you uh, help us get the word uh, of God out and spread it to more people, but it's our desire, our prayer that non-believers, those have yet to give their lives to Christ, will somehow, some way, be led by the Holy Spirit to this channel or to this video and be able to see the love of God in a much clearer way. And with your help, you can help us doing that. do that with your like and your subscription. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word. We confess that we've fallen short and made mistakes. But we thank you that you wake us up each and every day with brand new grace and brand new mercy. Now as we break into your bread of life, well, we ask that you lift us up higher. That we might see you clearer and better understand your will for our lives. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our pastor, Dr. Bacchus. We thank you for our Sunday school superintendent. We thank you for every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of creation. And we most certainly thank you for each person listening and watching right now that you might increase our faith for those of us that believe and draw non-believers out of darkness and into the marvelous light that the gift of salvation may be made available and accepted by all who hear this lesson. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, the sixth chapter of Hebrews follows the unknown author's warning to Jewish Christians in chapter five and through the first eight verses uh, prior to our lesson. It's the author imploring Jewish Christians to ignore the temptation to turn away from the gospel of Jesus Christ and return to the practice of Judaism. As the Jewish Christians and the early converts in the first century church experienced extreme hardships and even setbacks in ministry, specifically pers uh, persecution at the hands of the Romans and the Greeks and even at the hands of their Jewish brothers and sisters who rejected the gospel, they began to question how come they weren't seeing the success and the victory and the 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 what what the the power and might of the gospel through their work. There was a common belief that just because that you're a Christian, that all of a sudden things would work out for you, that you would have some type of superpower where you would uh, be able to ignore or not even feel the attacks of the enemy. That when those people tried to stand in your way and tear you down, they would stumble and fall. Yet the early Jewish Christians in particular experienced extreme harassment and discomfort in the way that they lived their lives, and they began to be urged uh, by their family members, their brothers and sisters, and the people that they grew up with to return to their old ways. So the author here, he, he really spends a lot of time after kind of warning them about the dangers of falling away, uh, focusing on the faithfulness of God towards those that show a maturity of faith and a dedication of faith 
And that's really the main theme of the sixth chapter of Hebrew, that when you're able to overcome these setbacks, these distractions, these uh, trials and tribulations in the work of ministry, that you'll not only grow in your faith, you'll see God in a much clearer way, and you'll be able to endure and maintain hope and faithfulness in the midst of difficult times. So our lesson is broken down into four different parts. We'll be reading from the New King James Version, uh, from Hebrews chapter 6, the ninth verse, all the way to the last verse, the 20th verse. And I believe that God is going to be able to show us, uh, through the words of this author, uh, why we can celebrate and even uh, uh, relish in difficult times, trusting that God will use them to strengthen our faith and allow us to develop a deeper and more lasting trust and hope in him. So the first part of our lesson is entitled, You Did Good. It's, in, it's taken from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 and 12, and it reads, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So the author of Hebrews uses the fifth chapter to point out the possibility of allowing immaturity and faith to distract and divert believers on the road to a strengthened faith in Christ. These are people that have given their life to Christ and that the circumstances of life, the setbacks in ministry, the lack of success, at least from their own perspective, is causing them to become weakened in their faith and actually question if they're on the right path. In verse 6, the author changes his tone and he begins to encourage Jewish Christians that are struggling with this decision to remain steadfast and continue to grow in the body of Christ. He makes it clear that even though he has warned them about falling away from the truth, he now encourages them, uh, sharing that because they are true believers, he has no doubt in their mind that their road would become better in the near future and God would finish what he has started in their life. True believers have the promise of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it happens the moment in which we believe. So not the moment we're baptized, not the moment that we join church, but the moment that we place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, a benefit of our salvation, a reward of our faith is God placing his Holy Spirit inside of us. It means that we are indwelled with his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit not only guides our walk, but it also seals us in the faith which means that we're permanently kept and held together within the body of Christ by the presence of his spirit in our lives. This is a reference to our belief in the perseverance of saints, which means that once we're saved, we'll always be saved. It's a trust and a belief that the work that God has started in us will one day be completed through his sovereignty and through his grace. Recently, one of my instructors at school recognized that I had turned in an assignment late for the first time. Uh, he sent me an email and told me that the penalty for turning in an assignment was five points off your grade and that he recognized it was out of character of what he had known of me and what he had seen of me since I've been in, in this class. He sent me the email warning me against becoming lethargic in my education, and I immediately responded reminding him that I had already communicated to him that I would be traveling on Friday evening from Memphis and that I would have to uh, turn in my assignment late, and he had offered to extend grace to me when grading my assignment. The, rep the instructor replied to my response that he was pleased with my work, that I was still on track to get an A in the class, but he just wanted to extend to me the warning to make sure that it wasn't a repeated mistake. This is the same thing that the author is doing in the letter, but instead of trusting the faithfulness of his listeners or of a, uh, a, a usually punctual student, he's now putting his trust in God and his faith in God who oversees the faith of his children. Therefore, this warning is not given as a chastisement through chapter 5 and the first eight verses of chapter 6, but rather it's given as an encouragement, pointing out what is inevitable, 
that those that begin in Christ will finish in Christ, and we will all stand beside each other throughout all of eternity in heaven. Again, if it was a student, even a student that usually gets the assignment done on time, even a student that has a proven track record of high marks, they will still eventually make a mistake or get a bad grade. But thank God that we're not dependent on our own efforts or we're not dependent on our own abilities or we're not dependent on our own future actions. Our salvation and the hope of the promise of eternal life that God gives us is based on God's faithfulness to us alone and nothing else. He goes on to say in verse 10 that God has not only seen their work and by work, the work of the ministry that these Jewish Christians, uh, the listeners to this, uh, uh, the author of Hebrews is writing to, he's not only seen their work and the efforts of their faith, but he also remembers what they've done. And he will never go against his own nature when dealing with his children. This alludes to the relationship that we have with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Once we place our faith in Jesus, we immediately become heirs of salvation and members of the body of Christ. This makes us children of the Most High, and we become full recipients of the gifts that accompany relationship. While we sometimes become frustrated with the shortcomings and the mistakes of others, and at times even ourselves, God is just. He's never forgetting that our mistakes and our sins are covered with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and therefore our efforts in sharing the gospel are never in vain, but rather they are protected and overseen, governed by God, who gives us victory when we are within his will. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. He basically told his father, I'm sick of waiting until you die. Give me my inheritance now. He ran off with his inheritance, went to a distant land, spent all that he had, found himself broke and sleeping in the pen's pit, only later to have God return to him, only later to have God allow him to come to his senses, and then he made his way back to his father's house. <clears throat> when he came back home, his father did not reject him or turn him away. He simply celebrated the return of his son, restored him as a full heir, gave him a ring, a robe, and celebrated with the feast of the fatted calf. This is an illusion to what God does for us when we stumble or make mistakes or have weaknesses in our faith. Regardless if it's a small mistake or we find ourselves sleeping in the pig's pen after falling away from the word or the gospel of Christ, God allows us and welcomes us back into the fold, restoring us and giving us full rights and privileges as an heir of salvation. And so when we experience hardships, both, both external and internal, we can celebrate the fact that once we're saved, we're always saved, and God always has a place for us in the body of Christ. And it's a reminder that our salvation is not dependent on our works or our efforts or even our obedience, but it's dependent on the promises of God, which is true to all believers. This encouragement should be used as fuel for our motors as believers. That we should be as diligent as possible in our assurance and our hope as our efforts to work for the body of Christ are not in vain, but rather promise to bring forth glory to God and bring forth salvation to those that don't believe. Sometimes we extend all of our energy and effort in the work of ministry without submitting to and celebrating the promise that comes with our salvation. For believers, when we experience setbacks or discouragement, we should ignore the worldly temptation to turn back or to give up and instead move forward with the joy prepared by the promises and the faithfulness of God. We should never allow circumstances of life to distract us or to slow us down, but instead remember those that have come before us and imitate their example of perseverance and steadfastness. For Jewish Christians, Abraham was the father and the model of great faith. David was a man after God's own heart. The apostles showed a dedication to the gospel, even to the point of death, and Paul became an example of sacrifice and faithfulness. However, with all these examples, there were still mistakes and uh, distractions along the way. And so for all believers, if you don't want to look to Abraham, if you don't want to look to David, if you don't want to look to the apostles or the heroes of faith, 
or the ancestors of faith or even our current church leaders, there is a man named Jesus Christ that we can look to who has set the example, who has given the blueprint of how to be faithful to God regardless of the situation that he found himself in. And so the author here is trying to tell believers that, listen, I understand that it's difficult. I understand that it's hard. But don't be tempted to turn away, to stumble, or to fall. Look at how God has kept his promise to Israel for thousands of years. Look at how God's promise to Abraham has come true. Look at how God's promises in our own lives have been kept time and time again. And use the memory and the reference and the blueprint of faithfulness that all those before us has had and even we've had in our own lives to maintain, persevere, and be steadfast in the midst of the current challenges that we see. In this politically charged world where polarization has never been uh, more high, where whites are against blacks, where Republicans are against Democrats, where Northerners are against Southerners, where uh, naturalized citizens, citizens are, are, are against uh, uh, born citizens, we have to recognize that we can still break through the challenges that stand before us. We can break through the barriers that the enemy has lifted up around us and do the work of the gospel that it stands beyond the challenges of this world. So the first part of our lesson is you did good. The second part of our lesson is you can trust him. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 13 through 15 read, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. The example of Abraham is lifted up. God answered his prayer for a son, even after the age of childbearing had long passed. God kept his promise of protection for his seed, even after thousands of years of disobedience and rebellion from the children of Israel. Abraham was not perfect. He doubted and made his own plans, but God remained true to his word and delivered Israel through his seed. This was not because of Abraham's faithfulness or because of Abraham's, or excuse me, Israel's obedience or because of David's favor. It was all because God has an inability to renege or go back on his word. I once heard a sermon preached entitled, Things That God Can't Do. One of the first points in the sermon was that God cannot lie. When we look at Abraham, even after, after the promise was fulfilled through the birth of his son Isaac, God tested the faith of Abraham and asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac to God. Abraham remained steadfast and faithful to the commandments of God, and as he lifted up the knife to plunge it into his son and sacrifice him to God, God steadied his hand right at the point of death and placed a ram in the bush as a sacrifice to God to replace Abraham's son. Abraham's faith in that moment was one of total commitment and endurance. He endured hardships, he endured setbacks, he endured personal failures, but because he eventually and patiently endured the work and fulfillment of God's promise in his life, he was able to see the fulfillment of that promise. The author instructs the listeners here to imitate the faith of Abraham, to have the patience to endure whatever comes our way, because our endurance only allows time for us to trust and place our faith in God and for that trust and faith to be strengthened over time. Abraham's patience and endurance allowed him to obtain and see the promise of God come to fruition in his life. Sisters and brothers, whatever God has promised us privately and definitely what he has declared among the heavens, if we maintain and, be, and remain patient, persevering and steadfast in our faith, we can see the promise of God come true in our lives in, in the same way. Our faith is only strengthened when we reject the desire to turn back and instead stay the course that God has placed us on, regardless of what may be happening in or around us. And so for these Jewish believers who were up against persecution, who, was, who were up against ridicule, who allowed doubt to sneak into their faith and into their hearts and minds, the author is telling them, remain faithful. Look at how God has remained faithful to his children, and if God is faithful to us, the least that we can do is be faithful to him. So you do it good is the first part of our lesson. You can trust him is the second part of our lesson. And now we're moving to the third part of our lesson, which is entitled, I Swear. 
Hebrews chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 reads, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So the author compares the promises of man to the promises of God. Now when men give their word, we believe it and act on it, even though we have experienced lies in our past and we anticipate more lies in our future. Yet we blindly follow corruptible men as if their word should not be questioned. If we are able to trust men who have proven time and time again to be short of their word, then what reason do we have to question or doubt God who has never lied, never deceived, or never misled? To doubt God who has been true to his word since the heavens were formed is blasphemous in itself. It means that we fail to recognize God as true and just, and it implies that we never really trusted him and never really knew him. I clearly remember 1996 when Michael Jordan hit the game-winning shot over Byron Russell as the Bulls secured their sixth championship ring. As soon as Mike got the ball, everyone watching the television knew that the game was over. There was no doubt because Michael Jordan had proven time and time again that he could be counted on in these situations. However, the reality of the situation is Michael Jordan missed game-winning shots 26 times. Jordan was asked to take the game-winning shot and missed 26 times. If we can count on a man with certainty who missed 26 game-winning shots, missed over 9,000 shots in his career, and lost over 300 games, why is it that we question God who has never been short of his word? The strong consolation that the author mentions shows us that God's word is not dependent on our faithfulness, on our health, on our status, on our attendance, or even on our giving, but it is only dependent on his nature. Perhaps if we played a role in God's ability or his desire to keep his word, there might be a need for doubt or hesitation. But God's word solely depends on his own nature, on his own character, and on his own love for we, his children. Finally, in verse 18, the security of salvation that lies in God is referred to as a place of refuge. During Bible times, there were cities of refuge that allowed those that were lost or that were wandering in the wilderness to escape the dangers of the area and find security, rest, and restoration within its city walls. The cities of refuge were of great need because they offered security and safety to those that were unable to provide it for themselves. The author makes it clear that the refuge that God makes available to all of creation is accessible, available, and able to protect, secure, and maintain all that seek him out and become children of him through a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we ignore, doubt, or question the security of God, it's as if we're wandering out of the place of refuge and we find ourselves exposed to the very dangers that God has just saved us from. As believers, we can look to the example of God's faithfulness, to the fathers of our faith, to his son Jesus Christ, and even within our own lives and uh, to identify that God's security and salvation has been a permanent place of refuge and has protected us and kept us since the moment we first believed. There is no reason to leave the security of God that has proven to be steadfast and immovable for thousands of years simply because we're uncomfortable with the situation that we find ourselves in. There's a term that says the grass is always greener on the other side. I became extremely frustrated this week because I have a car that has had two flat tires in consecutive weeks and every time I get a flat tire, the city that I'm in is not able to repair the tire. I was so frustrated that I almost wanted to give the car up. It's a good car that I have no problems with, that I've paid more than half of it off of now. And for me to abandon the situation now is just out of frustration. 
Yes, I endured some difficulties, but God kept me in the midst of them. Yes, I had some uneasy days with that car, but God has blessed me with it and it gets the job done. I would rather start over, go into further debt getting another car, simply because I didn't like the situation I found myself in. It happens in our churches, it happens in our ministries, it happens in our conventions, it happens in our relationships, it happens in our careers, it happens in our education, it happens in our health, it happens in our finances. We become frustrated with the place that we're in right now and we are willing to abandon all the progress we've made and go backwards, start over, or even miss out on the fullness of God's promises simply because we're experiencing or enduring a hardship at the moment. I don't know about you, but when I look back over my life and every situation I found myself in, they have one thing in common, that God was able to hold me together, keep me, and secure me in the midst of difficult situations. And I thank God that in times when I was weak in my faith, or when I struggled to keep my eye on the prize, that God strengthened me and encouraged me and held my hand, carrying me through difficult situations, allowing me to maintain faith in him and trusting that he would bring me through just as he has done for me time and time again before. So the first part of our lesson was you did good. The second part, you can trust him. And we just looked at I swear. The third and final part of our lesson is you rule Jesus. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 19 and 20 read, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The nautical example of an anchor is used to identify the security uh, that believers have in God. Anchors are used to remain steadfast in the midst of troubled waters. And when the winds blow and when the storms rage, it's easy for unsecured ships to blow and be thrown to and from and even find themselves off course. An anchor is dropped in the midst of the storm to stand firm and maintain safety and safety even while the storms of life range around us. Our anchor is never placed in the word. Excuse me. Our anchor is only placed in God's word. It's never placed in the world or in our own abilities, but rather it should be placed in God alone, who is able to keep us and who is able to hide us in the times of trouble. Again, God being this uh, idea that he's our refuge. This letter is written to Jewish Christians who were tempted to return to the ways of Judaism and who experienced hardships and tribulations while doing the work of Christ and doing the work of the gospel. The author reminds them to anchor themselves in the Lord, to endure what the enemy stand, uh, sends their way, and to not depend on their own strength or ability, but by the power of God in their lives and the certainty of his promises, be able to endure and trust in God's deliverance for all believers. When our hope and our confidence is anchored in the Lord, we are able to see God clearer and we get almost a behind-the-scenes look at God's faithfulness and his glory and the promises that he has for us, his children. This alludes to a maturity in faith that all believers should desire and yearn to grow into. For an immature Christian, it's easy, easy to be distracted and lose focus on God. A mature Christian presses towards the mark of the high calling of Christ. We ignore the distractions of the world, and we see God in a clearer and more glorified way. Just as John the Baptist was a forerunner for Jesus who, by preparing the people in the way, Jesus is the forerunner for all believers, paving the way for us as we uh, faithfully follow him in the path of righteousness and ultimately into eternal glory. Jesus not only shows us the way, but he prepares the way by removing all obstacles from the path of believers and allowing us to enter into the fullness of God's promise without restraint or dilemma. Any reference to the priesthood of Melchizedek refers to the eternal priesthood that has no beginning and no end. Without going into detail, the priesthood of Aaron, or the Aaronic priesthood, was a tribal priest who oversaw the family. Melchizedek was set apart, a priest anointed by God as a priest of the Most High, that had an eternal reign. This verse or this reference in verse 20 identifies Jesus Christ, 
as our forebearer, who is a priest whose reign is eternal. That Jesus' reign as priest in our lives and as priest over the entire world has no beginning and no end. The priest intercedes on behalf of the believer, and Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, reminding God of the shedding of his blood for the remission of sins for those of us that believe. Therefore, our sins are covered by Jesus' blood, and our salvation is sealed by his sacrifice. As long as God the Father continues to be God, and as long as Jesus continues to be his son, the promise and the hope of our salvation will continue to stand the test of time and endure the hardships of the work of the gospel. What an amazing lesson. It's just a simple reminder. Yes, if it was man, perhaps we would doubt the promises. Yes, if even if it was ourself and it was contingent on our own ability to keep our end of the bargain, perhaps we would doubt the promises of God. But God's promises are rooted in the sacrifice of his son, on, in the love of his, uh, in the love that he has for his people, and in the very nature of God himself, that he cannot lie, that he cannot deceive, and that he can never be short of his word. And so when we experience difficulties, and I hope I'm being repetitive enough, when we experience difficulties, we are able to endure and maintain our faithfulness, our steadfastness, our perseverance, and the hope in God's promise because we know that when we look back over our lives, when we look throughout the biblical record, and when we hear the testimonies of the heroes and ancestors of our faith, God has never been short of his word. If he said it, he's going to do it, and we should believe it. And if God promised us eternal life, if we give our lives to his son, Jesus Christ, one day, at the sound of a trumpet, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those of us that are alive will be raptured into heaven for eternal life. And those of us that have transitioned on to death will be welcomed into glory. I look forward to that day. I can't wait till I get there. And it is my prayer that I will see you there as well. Uh, as always, we thank you for joining us in our Bible study. Please, uh, we're so thankful for your presence, for your support but most importantly for your prayers. Uh, we ask that you continue to pray for our church, pray for our pastor, pray for our leadership, pray for each and every member from the oldest and longest serving member to the newest born baby. We trust that God has something special in store for us here at Friendship, and we know that he has something special in store for you as well. So if you have yet to give your life to Christ, we pray that something has been said or done today that will help you see God in a more clear way, that his love will be revealed to you in a much deeper way, and that you will move from darkness into the marvelous light. All it takes to be saved is to admit that we're a sinner, believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And we too can inherit, you too can inherit the promise and the gift of eternal life. Uh, we encourage you to join us as we uh, worship not only in God's word and study, but we also worship in our giving. We have four ways for you to support the ministry here at Friendship Baptist Church. You can give online on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can give on cash app, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462 or or as always, you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. Let me make a, a request to you. Our annual youth day is coming up July 14th. We're really excited. Our youth have been working extremely hard towards it, and our youth ministry is growing. Uh, thankfully, over a year ago, just under a year ago, actually, Dr. Back has allowed us to start our youth church. We've been meeting uh, once a month, and we've started our youth choir, and we're looking for ways to grow our youth ministry. If you don't mind, and if God moves in your heart to do so, would you consider giving an extra or a special donation towards the youth ministry? You can make a notation in whatever method you're giving. Uh, we want to be a blessing to our young people. Uh, there's some things that we want to do, both uh, in a fellowship and during the worship service on the 14th. And so if you don't mind and God moves you to do so, would you consider making a special donation to our youth ministry here at Friendship Baptist Church? Also, we encourage you to support the other ministries that we have here at Friendship. Our Sunday school meets through conference call and Zoom, as well as in-person services for adults, children, and youth at 930 on Sunday. Our live worship experience is each Sunday morning at 11 a.m., where you'll hear preaching from our pastor, Dr. Backus. Our intercessory prayer call is each Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. 
Our fitness class meets each Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Our layman brotherhood ministry meets each Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. And our women of faith meet on the fourth Tuesdays of each month at 7 p.m. And then finally, our Bible study takes place each week on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. taught by our pastor, Dr. Bacchus. If you want more information about any of our uh, ministries, any of our Christian education opportunities, or any of our worship opportunities, just give us a call, shoot us an email, leave a message in the chat, and we'll be happy to tell you how you can become a part of our friendship family or join us in some of our other opportunities to serve and worship throughout the week. If you're not in the Chicagoland area and you're looking for a church home, let us know. We'll help you find a place. We would love to for you to join with us virtually, or we'll help you find a place where you can worship in person in your local area. And so it's, it's our desire that you find a place where you can grow and be strengthened in the body of Christ. And if you've yet to give your life to Christ, a place where you can learn more about what God has done for us when he gave his son to die for our sins. As always, again, we thank you for your presence and your support but mostly for your prayers. We'll dismiss in prayer. We hope to see you at our 11 a.m. worship service. And if God says the same, we'll see you next Sunday, same time, same channel, for another General Sunday School Lesson Overview. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that has been said and done. Father, we've entered this place to worship, but we entered to serve. So give us what's needed to uh, survive the attacks of the enemy, to remain steadfast, faithful, and persevering in the midst of faith challenges and challenges to the gospel of Christ. Help us to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word, that we might be lights shining in the midst of darkness, that others might see our good works, but be drawn closer to you through the love that we share, that we reciprocate as you continue to love us. Father, we confess that we've fallen short, but help us to turn away from those sins and move closer to you so that we can live a life of righteousness, that others might see our example and be strengthened in their faith or drawn closer to you for if they yet to believe. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for our Sunday school superintendent. Thank you for every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of creation. And a special thank you for each person that's watching and listening right now, that we might be encouraged and strengthened in our faith according to your purpose in our lives. It is in your son's name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and God bless you.